Welcome, we're glad that you're able to join us today for our next edition of our 49er Industry Chat. My name is Noemi Guevara, the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Cal State Long Beach. Before we start our session, we would like to let you know that this session is being recorded and it will live on our website at csulb.edu forward slash alumni for you to view at a later time. We also encourage you to use our Q&A button located below to submit any questions for our guest speaker today. And now I would like to introduce your moderator for the chat, Lucia Koss, who graduated in 1975 from the College of Liberal Arts with a degree in Spanish and was recognized as a distinguished alumna in 2005 and now serves as our CSUB Alumni Council board member. Thank you, Lucia, for moderating the chat. And now I turn it over to you. Great, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Uh, let's start with just saying that our speaker today, after 28 years of dedicated service in the transit industry, uh, he um, retired in 2019 uh, from the one in Culver City. He's also held roles with Long Beach Transit, Foothill Transit, and the last 18 years of service was with Culver City as Deputy Director, then as Director in General Management for the Transportation Department. His responsibilities included the city's public transportation system, city equipment uh, maintenance, and air quality programs. As a visionary leader, he served as chair of the Los Angeles County Municipal Operators Association, uh, vice chair also of access programs, and chair of the California Transit Indemnity Pool. Art holds a bachelor's degree in finance and a master's degree in public administration, both from CSULB. So leading today's industry chat, please welcome Art Ida. Well, I first and foremost wanna thank uh, everybody for being on the call and also uh, really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you. And I wanna thank uh, the Cal State Long Beach uh, Alumni Association for reaching out to me and allowing me to talk to you today, with you today. Okay, well, I'd love to just go ahead and start wherever you want, Art. <laughs> well, um, maybe I'll start by just telling a little bit about myself and, you know, where I guess my career path towards public transportation. So I guess I'll start by graduating from Long Beach State long ago in 1985. I graduated with my business administration degree in finance. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to land a job with Xerox Computer Systems. Um, and I'll tell you, working at Xerox, I actually saw the version of Windows prior to Microsoft. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was, Xerox at that time was probably one of the more leading technology industry, uh, firms. And I, you know, I was very lucky to, to have that job. But I, you know, I guess working there for a couple of years, I was recruited by my old boss to, to leave and come to TRW Space and Defense and working under um, more defense contracts. So I did that. Um, I monitored the defense contracts. And uh, I guess one of the benefits from doing that, I also was able to see that defense contracts are being closed early. And so I kind of gauged that and said, wow, I think that there's going to be a major layoff. So I started looking for another job, found this job at Long Beach Transit in grants. Um, didn't really know what was entailed with that, but, you know, was a little bit desperate to try to get out into it and get into a stable job. And uh, I, so I left, got the job at Long Beach Transit, and probably about a week after I got the job at Long Beach Transit, TRW laid off about 3,500 employees, and I would have definitely been one of them. So um, starting to work at Long Beach Transit was interesting, but I, I immediately, I have to say, I immediately fell in love with public transportation. And um, I'm always asked, well, what made you really like stay into it so long? And why did you like you know, working in public transportation? Well, number one, it's well-funded. If you look throughout the history, 
probably almost every year it's it's funded really well um, because of the fact that it's the, the the need for public transit doesn't really go away it's always it always grows as we see traffic gets worse every year public transit is probably one of the more most important ways to combat traffic so it's never going to go away um, I started realizing all the different areas that you can go into in terms of public transit. I mean, public transit not only has bus drivers, I think a lot of people think, oh, mechanics and bus drivers, but, but it also funds areas of finance, marketing. Now, when I talk about marketing, it's even more um, important, becomes more important because of social media and the way people communicate. So marketing for us right now is very huge. Um, there's um, information technologies. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the level of technologies, um, the evolution of technologies in public transportation. Um, so that gives you an idea of how, how technologies plays a very important part into service delivery. Um, the other area is urban planning and transit planning. As cities, like we've seen, there's a lot been, there's been a huge movement in urbanization where people are coming back into cities and working and you see a lot of huge developments with very dense housing. Well, all that creates some pretty challenging issues and transportation becomes a very important part in all, all of those areas to, to help, you know, with urban, working with urban planners to combat you know, huge issues in parking and congestion and everything else. Um, also, some of the other areas is in governmental relations. You know, we, we hit, there's always a lot of rules and regulations that tied into public transit, especially since we receive a lot of different funding. So government relations becomes very important. Um, construction management facilities, so, you know, just to illustrate you, there's there's so much um, potential for careers in, in public transit. So, of course, when I started seeing that, I, I, I was hooked. I said, yeah, this is what I want to do. All right, so some of us non-transit folks, uh, what, is, what is encompassed under public transportation? I know it's not, is it just buses or is it? Is it the, you know, the MT, uh, what is it, the MTA or the, the others? What, what's encompassed? So it, it's, it's different for different agencies in different areas. So um, for, for me in Cuba City, I was in charge of, as you mentioned, the equipment maintenance. That's maintenance of all the vehicles, uh, the, not only the buses, but the trash trucks, the, the fire trucks, you know, so, mm -hmm you know there's that but then also it could become parking you know if, if you're if you're in tra transportation you may be in charge of parking you may be sharing um so it could be it could expand to different areas um as well so even even it may become um, taxi and over, overseeing the taxi programs in the city. Some of the senior citizen, the, the disabled um, or handicapped service. So it, there is a really bi wide variety in terms of the level of responsibilities. You have to work closely with like the monorail, for lack of a better word, and other folks because of the transportation cross crossing each other or? Right, so so in LA County, uh, it's very unique com compared to other major cities. If you look at Chicago, you know, there may be like two major transit agencies, you know, the Chicago Transit Authority and maybe another transit authority. And here in, in Los Angeles County, there's 16 different municipal oh. operators <laughs> running <laughs> independently in within LA County. So as you mentioned, I used to chair the, the, the municipal operator group. It becomes really important for all of the transit agencies to coordinate and work together, um, you know, in order to provide, you know, seamless service throughout the LA County area. 
So it's 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 definitely dynamic here compared to everywhere else. Okay, Art, you did mention that coming straight out of Cal State Long Beach, you uh, got a job with Xerox. Uh, was that because you knew someone, or did you? What was the what was the area of focus? Because I know you had uh, your you know your uh, degrees uh, in um, what is what was it? Uh, uh, in finance. Right, finance and, and public, was it public administration? That's where later on I got my public administration degree. Right, um, so how does that, how does some of our, our listeners kind of look at that transition? Uh, your first job and what did you learn on, at both Xerox and TRW that eventually helped you get into the transit area? Well, um, in, in at Xerox, I was in accounting and so um, just working with accounting and working with, um, I guess, um, financial systems and financial systems processing and, you know, definitely helped me in terms of the finance background. And then, I, then I moved into to, to TRW, which was still in accounting, but more under contract accounting. And that, that's what landed me the job there. The thing that landed me the job that helped me get from TRW to Long Beach was in terms of the grants. Although um, Department of Defense is definitely different from Department of Transportation, there is a little bit of nexus between the way grants are, some of the rules in terms of how, how grants are, are, um, are basically how do you account for the, for, for grant money and the, the, the audit process, some of it may be similar. So I think that was one of the big nexuses in getting landing the job at Long Beach Transit. Are, are, the, are the, the grants from federal, state, uh, county? How? So um, to give you an idea, 80% um, of, of transit operations are funded through federal, state, and local grants. And I mean, there might be, 40 or 50 different grants that, are, that you use to fund operations. And each each area has different rules and regulations. Like some might, may only be used for capital acquisition. And within, even like in federal capital acquisition, there's a ton of rules that you have to follow. Like you can only buy certain percentage has to be a Buy America, or you have to go through even the procurement process has to be done a certain way. You have to do, mm -hmm. you have to allow for for a minority businesses or women businesses to compete into those contracts. There's, so there's steps that you have to do. So that's where the grants and the grants management is very important too. Well, that's a big difference between publicly held and privately held too, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it you become, you get very knowledgeable in those areas, you know, and you become very marketable because, you know, it, it's it's a lot lot to teach. You know, when you walk in, you not, you're not going to come in knowing all these rules and regulations. So right. uh, one of the questions that just came in was how hard is it to get your foot in the door in public transit? So what are like some of the entry positions? And um and transitioning from a di different sector. Can you kind of address those questions? So um, I'll tell you, if you're, if you're in school or if, you're, if you just graduated, there are tons of internships out there. Um, transit, I know a lot of my colleagues utilize interns to, to help with projects. I know, I think that Cobra City, we might have had 10 interns working for, and these are paid interns. Um, and so, you know, you get paid, you get paid for the work, but you also get great experience. And my thing is, you show people what you can do, chances are if they have a spot for you, you're gonna get in. And I think the other thing is, I would say is the transit agencies in LA County, all of my colleagues, all my other fellow directors and manager managers, we are we're almost like a tight knit family and we talk with each other. If I have somebody that's really good, an intern and I don't have a spot for them, I've had suggested 
to another agency, hey, I have a really good person here. If you could use this person, you know, you may want to take a look at him or her. And that's happened too. And, uh, you know, so I would say the first thing would be, you know, utilize interns. The other thing is in terms of a city, um, city positions have what they call uh, analyst positions, managerial analyst um, positions. And that's kind of a wide variety of work that you may do. Not one manager analyst from a city may work in public works doing one thing or may work for another um, department like, like sanitation. But if you go in and get a job in, as a management analyst and you do well, you'll be very marketable for any department in the city, including tra transportation. So I would say, you know, sometimes you can't, it's not always a straight path forward. Sometimes you work and you gain some experience, but, but exposure to public transit, you can make that transition. So all right, for some of our younger listeners or, or any of our listeners really, what are some of the key skill sets that uh, make you more marketable? for entry level? Um, I, I, I would say um, if you have any type of budgetary or accounting is always very marketable. But uh, you know, a lot of these positions are more analytical um, or if you can just do basic analytics uh, and, and write well. Uh, I think there's a lot of need for, for um, assistance in writing um, because we have to constantly write um, reports, um, especially reporting back for grants, you know, updates on like where we are on projects. So I think if you write well, you're, you become very marketable. Um, being able to read and interpret is very important, especially like if there's new laws or new air, air quality regulations, you know, a lot of times I'll have our analysts, hey, can you look at this and read this and then interpret and tell me, you know, how that's going to fit in with us. And so I think, you know, some of the level of skill sets is just more analytical and being able to interpret. So what are some of the basic, um, what's the basic advice in terms of get understanding what the transit departments do? Because you may end up getting some, uh, some people coming in looking for work, but they don't know anything about you, right? Right. So where's the best way to get that information? Well, first, I think that, you know, as being a public agency, we are open for, um, in terms of pop public documentation, all of the transit agencies have what they call a short range transit plan. And it basically gives you a a viewpoint of where we're going or where, where we stand in terms of ridership and what kind of new programs we're working on and what future programs. Mm -hmm. That's a good start to understand our industry. Every, every agency has to file it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that would maybe something to start with say, hey, you know, I live in the city of Torrance. Maybe I could see what the city of Torrance's short range mm -hmm. transit plan looks like and, and go through it and read it. And, mm -hmm. and I would say one of the other benefits in working in public transit. And I think my colleagues would say the same thing. I've met the most incredible people. And I know even me coming up through the ranks, I've had mentors. I've, I'm able to call a colleague and say, hey, I have a problem. This is what I'm dealing with. Have you had to deal with this? Oh, yes. And here, I'll give you a document. This is my, my staff report. I went to council. Mm -hmm. I think we all help each other. Um, and I think you learn by, by having these close relationships with each other. Right. So um, it, it really is, it's been a very rewarding career for me. And I, I would say all my colleagues would say the same thing. Well, I, you knew someone was gonna bring up COVID. So uh, to start with, because I know that with what probably wanna know what the impact of COVID is on your business, but also, how are some of these, in, you know, are there virtual internships? Are there openings right now for virtual or, or online positions? Or how, how are you guys dealing with that, number one? 
Okay. And then, then overall, how is, has COVID hit your industry? So I will give you only more, more perspective because fortunately <laughs> I haven't had to deal with it. I retired right before COVID hit, but I do know some of the things that some of the agencies, transit agencies are doing. And first and foremost is up the cleaning of it. And of course, you know, you're going to have people on setting rules. I know for the operators, they created a shield between the operator and the passenger. I, I know that they marked off seating. So the, there's a little bit of distance between passengers. Um, so I know that the transit agencies have tried to do their best to respond. I mean, it is a very difficult situation. You know, people still have to go to work. People still have to go. They re rely heavily on public transit. So um, I do know those are the some of the steps that transit agencies have, have, have done. In terms of virtual um, uh, internships, my understanding, a lot of the transit agencies are not in the office now. There, there are very few people in the office. I know in Culver City, some of my old colleagues are telling me they work from home. Uh, so I would imagine if they hire internships, they probably have them work from home. So um, uh, they would go to whatever the transit authority is and go online to their and look at their HR or hiring uh, area and that would give them the information possibly yeah you can call on and ask you know call the hr department and say hey hey have you um do you have any internships right now some of the cities will allow you to put what they call an interest card in so if you say hey this is what i want to look for if you so then you're on a list and then all of a sudden if there is something the city will give you an, a message and say hey we now have an opening for this so you know, I, I would encourage you just to engage with this with the HR department. Yeah. Um, so, what are the um, what are there is a question here is what are some of the major um, uh, uh, challenges uh, with your industry? And I'd like you to also kind of address the major COVID impact on on your industry. Well. Definitely COVID changes everything for us. Um, you know, one of the things, oh, so look, let's go back to just overall challenges. Right. You know, so um, it's gonna be a little bit different now and, and I've not had to deal with it because just to give you a, a kind of a, a glimpse of what I dealt with throughout my last maybe five years at Cobra City. Cobra City has always been kind of a hometown, small town, right in the midst of an urban area. So you would think it's like like a Mayberry RD kind of thing in, in this very urbanized area. Um, you have Sony there, but there was really not much going on there. Well, what happened? The tech industry went booming. You saw Silicon Beach emergence of Silicon Beach where Santa Monica had all these tech companies coming in, Facebook, Activision, <laughs> you name it, eBay. Um, you had um, Playa Vista come in, in there with a whole new community built for having these young technological professionals come in. But what was happening, they became very successful where they reached its capacity, housing. They didn't have enough housing. The traffic was horrendous. So what started happening was companies started coming into Culver City, Apple, Amazon, HBO. These companies, major companies within a couple of years said, hey, I want to come in here and bring 3,000 employees. <laughs> so, so it was very, it's, it's fun and dynamic, but also very challenging. Um, so how do you deal with that? I mean, um, you started having to assess the people that were coming in. And so we were getting in young professional people. Maybe some lived in Culver City, but Culver City was very, started to get really expensive. So they were coming from outlying areas. 
you then the train came. You had the Expo line coming in, now connecting from Santa Monica, Culver City to downtown area. So you brought a whole another bunch of people coming into the city, at least hopefully with public transit. But what we're finding is they weren't coming on the train. They were driving. Mm -hmm. So the strategy started becoming, hey, we have to figure out a way of getting people on that train and getting off the train and making it convenient them for them to go from the train to their, to their job. So we started working on different, um, different first and last mile options, you know, like bike sharing. I know the scooters came about and people, that became kind of a fattest thing. Oh, people are gonna use scooters, which really didn't kind of materialize. Um, we started working on a on-demand shuttle that would take people um, using their phone app. Hey, I'm at the station. And then five minutes later, a a shuttle bus would take them take them to the job. So we started working more in, a, in a innovative ideas. Does that? Then, mean, but I'm then, sorry. when then COVID hits, changes the game. People are working from home now. And the traffic isn't that, you know, it's still bad, but not as bad. So the question comes, well, what are you going to do about that? For me, and that, this is purely perspective because I'm not, I haven't been in the trenches over there seeing how COVID has affect. I'm guessing that there needs to, there probably will be a refocus on um, some of our senior population. Uh, one of the things that we knew, also knew was the baby boomers are getting older and older. And as people get older, they can't take regular fixed route transit systems. They're, they need assistance. So I think the next 10, 15 years, there's gonna be a big focus on more disabled type of service where they people are gonna to have to be helped or there needs to be more wheelchair or those type of services are gonna to have to emerge, um, definitely be, become more important. Now, this is a good seg segue to what you mentioned. And the, the question is, you mentioned the shift in marketing and communication. So that sounds like that's going to fit right. And that's why for post COVID, but also this whole new strategy with seniors, right? Right, right. And one of the things, uh, you know, what one of the things that we've what I was working on before I left was to develop some type of on-demand system for the seniors. Well, unfortunately, a lot of our seniors don't have a cell, a, a smartphone, um, are scared to death to use it. So I know there were some companies in development with a easy kind of handheld pod. So somebody could just press it and then it would alert them you know, that alert the company that they're, they want to ride. It tells them, you know, you know, when it's going to come, you know, I don't know where, where these companies are on that, but there's definitely some opportunities there to, to service our senior citizens better. And, and which we already know this is going to be a challenge for us. So companies come up or, or even agencies come up with ideas to, to make things better. So, that's why, that's what makes this industry so dynamic. Every time we were faced with a challenge, we have to figure out how to, you know, how to uh, overcome those, you know, using partnerships with companies or use our own internal policies and practices to do better. Well, Art, it sounds like that's a really good uh, challenge for some of our listeners to start thinking of, uh, in those terms, in terms of what are their saleable, saleable skills that they could bring to transit and maybe they could look at how they could help in those areas no, uh, in terms of technology, in terms of communications and marketing, right? Yeah, yeah one of the things I want to also mention is I put in my title revolutionary and I, <laughs> I, I showed one of my colleagues that and they were going, what do you mean revolutionary? So <laughs> I would explain that with all these things I just mentioned, let's let's take um, the electric scooters. Here comes this electric scooter coming to the city. 
there's people who think it's absolutely wonderful and great and and a and a, a viable option for for uh, alternative for for mobility for public transit well with everybody that with a certain demographic of people that say this is great you're going to get a certain amount of people who say this is horrible and and fight tooth and nail against it and you know, I had we had resident we Culver City experienced that where the residents didn't want it because they said it was laying on the sidewalk, they're gonna get hurt. People are riding, you know, without a helmet, you know, running into the traffic. So I guess what I'm saying is with every great innovation or great opportunity comes challenges and to where you have to deal with with the other side as well. You know, it almost becomes ever, so you have to feel, I guess, that balance mm -hmm. and still make the people who are, are going to be unhappy, how do you make them happy, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And yeah. so, you know, same thing as bike lanes or traffic lanes. I know there were some areas where <laughs> they eliminated one traffic lane to put a bike lane. Mm -hmm. And I heard that didn't, wasn't really popular. So, you know, as a transit professional, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, part of your job is to figure out how to balance those because you're gonna be faced with those. And, you know, not take it personally, but just know the fact that that's part of your job that you have to deal with on both sides of it. I wanna kind of take a step back, but also with current. Um, are there professional organizations where people can join, that people can join who are, interested in the transportation industry, whether it's on campus, uh, off campus, uh, that, that allows or welcomes young people, uh, and that maybe you even were a part of? Hmm. Not that I know of. I just know that, that you know, a lot, especially I know that in the last couple of years, LA Metro, which is one of the largest transit agencies in, in the United States, have been more engaging and I know they've hold, held a lot of public hearings and even with their budget, they throw all their budget out there and they say, give us your ideas of what you think. So I would say, you know, those are good ways to kind of get involved and see what's happening in, um, you know, or, you know, in your community, you could always, you know, monitor your agenda, your county, city council agendas. And when there's, when there's a good discussion, because I know for me, you know, once a year, part of the budget process to talk about what kind of things we're looking at, what kind of programs. That's a good opportunity for, for somebody who's interested to show up, listen to what the director says or the council members are saying, mm -hmm. and you know, and do get involved. And if you feel, you know, a certain way or feel, you know, that's your your your, you know, that's really your right. And I, I welcome that to to be able to say to to people, hey, this is what I feel should be done. You know, that feedback is important. So uh, one of the questions that's come up is, <clears throat> what is the, where, where, where did it go? My goodness. Uh, <laughs> the, when did you decide to go back to school for your MPA? Was that required uh, to move up? Uh, yeah, that was really on my own, but, but definitely I felt it was important to, to get that level of education to become an executive. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that I got a great education at, at Long Beach State. Um, I, I couldn't ask for more. It was convenient because I worked at Long Beach Transit right down the street, but, but I felt it was necessary um, definitely to have that. Okay, somebody resume. mentioned NACDO newsletters, National Association of City Transportation Officials. I, as a, a, that, uh, you know, from the previous discussion. Yeah, uh, I'm not just looking at that for ideas or, and then still attending the, the uh, meetings you mentioned. Yeah, and I see somebody made a comment with women in transportation. Yes, mm -hmm. there's, there's different, there's other organizations. Yeah, that one just that, came up too. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what, what, when you were, um, before you retired, what was a regular day, what did a regular day look like for you? <laughs> um, so one, one of the things I would do is I'd get up, get into, I always got in early to talk to the operators 
um, I felt it was important for me to always engage with them. So I walk in and they would, they would be sitting in, in their, their operator room waiting for their assignments, you know, and just greet them and ask them how they're doing. And, you know, always thanking them for the job that they're doing every day. Um, so I would do that. Then I would basically go over, for me, it's more reading and, and, and looking at regulations type of things that are coming up, looking at reports, how we, and basically monitoring how we are doing. Then my management team would start rolling in. I would sit with them and talk with them on what, what their plans are for the week. Like on Mondays was always a big day because, you know, they would basically say, this is what we're going to accomplish this week. And so like, okay. And then basically help them prioritize because I really pushed my management team really hard. So I would always have to help them prioritize their work. Um, you know, and they would say, well, which one should I do? This one or that one? And I say, well, I would help them prioritize. You know, basically, you know, my day is very dynamic because I might get a call from a council member. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've got a problem with a business owner who doesn't like your bus stop. <laughs> can you go talk with him? Or the, there's trash from the trash can that is overfilling and they're not happy. They want you to take the trash can out. I mean, my day was always very dynamic, you know. Mm -hmm. And you interface with everybody, with, with, with federal, state, and local officials, with legislators, with business people, with residents, with writers, with the union, with, you know, your day is so mm. dynamic, which I love, though it's not never the same every day. That's a lot of different, uh, I want to say customers, but users and, and people that you need to deal with. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> now, one of that, that's a good segue into this question is how did you grow in within transit? How did you learn transit? Um, one of the things I, I started assessing myself honestly and saying, okay, what areas do I not really have a lot of experiences? And working and coming from a finance background, I was always told, yeah, I don't think you'll ever get to become CEO because you don't have any transit operations experience or maintenance experience. So one of the things I did, and again, I have to thank Long Beach Transit because they've been so great and accommodating to me. I remember going into the, the CEO's office and asking them if I could work on a project. And so one of the projects I was given was to look at the customer service follow-up uh, complaint process which gave me a great opportunity because, you know, it gave me an opportunity to talk to the management team, the supervisors, the operators about the complaints that they get, you know, and does, I would ask them, to, you know, what's the follow-up process on it? You know, even how do we take the calls? You know, what kind of questions follow? Do we ever get back to the customer on you know, some of the complaints? So after that, I did a management letter, um, basically, looking at what I found and some suggestions. And I have to say, um, they took those suggestions and created a new customer um, service um, program. And, and they started seeing the numbers in terms of customer satisfaction get better. And so Long Beach has always been great in terms of their, their customer service, but um, and, and the amount of, of compliments they get, but it even went higher because of, I guess, a little bit better follow-up from it. But yeah, I was able to learn quite a bit from doing that process. And I think, you know, just moving up and then getting more ex executive exposure, leaving Long Beach and going to Foothill, I got to interface with the, with the board members and then, um, one of the things with Foothill, they have 32 cities that they service. Mm -hmm. So we would have to do briefings with the different city managers from different cities. So again, interfacing with them and then interfacing with the legislators of those areas also, you know, it just gave me a more deeper um, amount of experience and, and knowledge in those areas. 
I, you mentioned, and in, in, um, it kind of it, it falls in line with what you said about going to senior management. Uh, you talked about mentors. You had mentors. How did that happen? So, you know, when you go, when you go, when you go to um, meetings, uh, you have different levels. You know, transit does have a lot of meetings because going back to what I said, having 16 different agencies, having to coordinate services with each other and making sure we're all on the same page, there's a lot of meetings. And I would attend those meetings and look at the key people that are sitting at the table. You know, it's almost like, you know, the executives, all the general managers from the transit agency sit at the big table and you're kind of the support staff sitting on, on the outside, but you, you, you meet other colleagues your level, you know, then you get introduced to the other executives and you get a feel for ones that you feel comfortable and you developing a relationship and um, talk with them. And that's what goes back to what I said, transit people are very accommodating with each other. And I know I'm the same way when I worked. Um, I mean, I, I've helped some some of uh, the newer transit professionals get jobs with other transit agencies and are doing really well, you know, because of it. So that's what we do in terms of transit. So I would say, you know, just you have to put your ego aside. And yeah, you know, maybe you may get rejected sometimes, but chances are you won't. It, you know, most professionals understand what, you know, what you want and, and they probably appreciate your level of enthusiasm and will probably do what they can to help you. Well, and you back it up with expertise. So you don't do this right off, off the top. I mean, right up, right, right from the start. You need to kind of get to know the environment, right? Uh, right. We have about uh, three minutes. So a real quick question, and then I want you to just kind of finish with your final thoughts. Uh, how would you migrate from like wholesale retail into trans transportation? This question came from someone that just graduated with a master's in supply chain management. Um, well, I would say in terms of that area, there's still scheduling. There's still efficiencies in, in service in, in delivery of logistics. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of data in how you manage and schedule, you know, in terms of deliveries. Those schedulings, instead of having goods, <laughs> you have people and you have service delivery in terms of a bus meeting the schedule to pick up a certain amount of passengers with a certain amount of time on a certain line with a certain amount of traffic. So you can make a nexus of it. I think that I think that people who, professional people, and I think especially nowadays, they let go that you have to have 20 years experience to do this job, you know, which is kind of ridiculous because of the fact that things are so dynamic now, <laughs> it changes anyways. Mm -hmm. So I think what you have to show is your level of aptitude and whether you can adapt to a change in a tip, tip in a particular industry, I guess, and that's, I guess, my own personal philosophy. And not everybody shares it, but I think the younger professionals will probably think that way because things are so dynamic. Look at COVID. Like I just mentioned, COVID has changed everything in our industry that fast overnight. And so, if you don't change and you can't adapt to change and can't analytically figure out how to change it to make it better, you are not gonna make it, you're gonna fail. Got about a, about a half a minute. I think you already started your final points. That was <laughs> I did. So final last words, Art. <laughs> well, you know, for those who are, are, are looking for an industry and are looking for an industry that has a wide variety of opportunity, think about it nationwide. We have how many different transit agencies and picking up millions and millions of people. And it's not gonna go away, it's not. Mm -hmm. So that's, I would definitely encourage you, you know, to look at this industry if it interests you. And it's very rewarding. I know working in an agency and picking up 20 million passengers a day. And when I, when I would ride the bus, I would see the people that were serving. 
and going, well, I'm, I'm so happy I work in this industry. I mean, you really, you get a level of satisfaction doing this type of work. We're right at, yeah, we're right at closing, but I wanted you to mention the way that they can communicate with you in the next two weeks, and then we'll turn it over to Noemi to do the close. Okay, yeah, so I created a, a email address just for you guys to ask questions if you think of something, and it's ask art transit at gmail.com okay so and that I'm should sure be easy give, I'm, sure you'll give it to, I'm sure you'll give it to noemi thanks so much art and i want to let's turn it back over to noemi to close okay great where are you thank you art and lucia for a great <laughs> chat today we are really thankful for your time and Definitely, if anyone is interested in connecting with Art, um, please, if you didn't catch the email address, please contact us and we're happy to share it. Um, again, thank you for attending. Uh, we encourage you to follow us on social media to learn about future programs like this. And we thank you for your time. <laughs>